Hello and welcome to this edition of Nature Scene. I'm Jim Welch with naturalist Rudy Mankey and we're in Horry County in eastern South Carolina on the edge of the Carolina Bay, a mysterious geographic place. And I say mysterious, Rudy, because so much has been written and so little yet known. Yeah, it's still very mysterious because we know that these elliptical depressions are very common on the coastal plain, mainly in the Carolinas, which gives it the name Carolina Bays. And uh, the formation, the exact formation of them is still arguable. But uh, they're very, very special places, unique places, because on a sandy coastal plain, they're a little lower, they get wetter, a lot of vegetation builds up there, and it's almost like a boggy area. And we'll be talking about uh, the plants that live in that wet place, as opposed to plants that are found on sand rims, which are usually associated with these bays. People used to believe maybe meteorites crashed into the ground here, and that's one uh, theory. We're and some still believe that. Sure. Yeah, we're not really sure what happened. But once depressions formed, water got in them. Prevailing winds sort of formed ellipses that are kind of in a northwest to southeast orientation, and then the plants moved in. We're in an open area here, but just behind us you can see the thick vegetation that is so typical of a Carolina Bay, and we'll talk about some of those plants specifically uh, in a few moments. But a lot of evergreen species do well. And I suppose the name bay may come from the fact that there are three plants called bays, <laughs> red bay and sweet bay and loblolly bay, that really do well in those depressions. So that's an accepted theory as to why they're called bays. Mm -hmm. And then that sand rim is, is a totally different habitat. Just look in front of us here. I mean, the plants that dominate are tall, longleaf pines that love sandy situations. Look at the big cones on those trees and long needles, so the name longleaf pine certainly does make sense. But that is the dominant tree species here. And what happens often in these sandy areas is fire comes through, and that is really something that does change the world. Just look off in the distance there, and you can see how fire really kills a lot of the shrubby plants and allows these herbaceous species to come up. And look at the ferns in the distance over there. What, two different kinds of ferns? Yeah, the low one there, um, Close to the ground, about a foot off the surface, is the uh, bracken fern, very widely distributed fern, doing well here. And then the clumps of uh, fronds that come up or leaves that come up a little higher is uh, cinnamon fern. Beautiful new green. Now again, the shrubs, the growing part of those shrubs was killed by the fire. The stem on those ferns is underground. It's called a rhizome. And goes up for many feet? If you've got an underground stem and the fire comes through, you lose your leaves, so what? You send up new leaves from that protected stem. Now here's a plant right in front of us that does well in boggy situations, and you usually associate them a lot with Carolina bays. One of the carnivorous plants, pitcher plant is the common name. This one is the one called a hooded pitcher plant. Look at those little translucent spots on the uh, back side of that modified leaf. Do you find those on other pitcher plants? Those Not kinds of really, no, that's typical of the hooded pitcher plant. And look at the way the top of that pitcher now really does flop down a good bit. We'll probably see some other pitcher plant species in a moment. Carnivorous in that it's a meat eater? It takes in insects mainly and other animals that might get trapped. Sweet smell coming out and then that tubular leaf has digestive fluid at the bottom. The insect falls in and gets digested uh, by the plant, giving some trace elements probably that it couldn't get out of the soil to these plants. The stem on that is underground. When the fire came through, no problem. It sends up new leaves, and look, look at the flowers. Mm. Isn't that interesting, the way they tilt down like that? And you see petals and sepals there are very, very colorful. Is mid-May a good time to, to see carnivorous plants? Yeah, it really is. Not only the, the leaves that help you identify them, but also the, uh, the beautiful flowers. One of the carnivorous plants, I bet we'll see more. Look at the yellow out here now, a lot of color. We saw green a moment ago. What, what blossoms are Brilliant those? yellow. Wild indigo is the common name for that. It's in the pea family. You can see those flowers very clearly there. And then those new uh, leaves are very interesting. That's a strange plant. It forms a little you know, pea-like pod on it, a uh, fruit pod. But look what happens as the plant dies. There's last year's plant right next to it. See, it's, it's black, very dark mm -hmm. and the stiff and sturdy. That's where the yeah. color comes from, I guess. Mm -hmm. Used in dried arrangements. Mm -hmm. uh, um, every now and then, but very, very sturdy, doing well. Last year's and then the new this year's growth. Beautiful flowers. I'm sure we're going to see more. Why don't we just head off in this direction? 